Right. Okay. Do okay. I have to hit got it? No, yep, you're fine. Got it. Um, all of you have probably been here long enough now to see this first slide. So you, you've gotten a taste of what it is that, uh, that we're going to be looking at. I will try to go through the slides fairly quickly. I have 72 of them, so uh, I will uh, I try not to take too much of your time. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to just introduce the um, uh, philosophy behind the design and see if I can <laughs> make this a little smaller so it doesn't get in the way of the, the uh, slide. Um, we had four main uh, philosophies that we wanted to use uh, to create this. And this was all done at the very beginning. So we wanted a physical presence that is a scale a little bit bigger than a, than a regular domestic clock. You now see how big it is. It's about 24 inches wide. Uh, we wanted complexity, which I think all of this you see is uh, apparent. And we wanted movement. And again, there are many, many things that are happening on this at all times. And I think that's where we basically uh, really make this machine stand out from what most others have ever been. And then I wanted it to look beautiful. And that is of course a very subjective thing. But as we go along, I will show you different elements of the clock as to why I think we were able to achieve that. And then throughout, there are other whims whimsical touches like uh, birds and snails and, and all sorts of uh, allegorical animals in the form of the detents and the uh, fly uh, governors and so forth. And what I've done is I've made this sort of like a small world where you have uh, a, a base that, that uh, supports a forest of wheels the frames are like uh, trees with, our, with uh, branches that have red fruit, which are the chitons. And then above it is a firmament, which is represented by the ori. Another thing I wanted to do on this uh, machine was to have the minimum number of dials conveying the maximum amount of complications. And I imagine you get the horological journal, so you've already looked at uh, page 404 and it shows you the list of the complications. We are packing 71 complications into what is fairly a, a small amount of dial work. <laughs> this is just a quick uh, uh, view of the uh, uh, index page from my website. So if you go to this uh, uh, URL down here, you can see everything from the very beginning in 2003 when I started my first concept designs all the way to uh, about three months ago. There hasn't been much happening in the past three months. It's just been debugging. So you're not seeing much more. Now, here we are uh, looking at um, a slide, an early slide with Andrew. He's two years old, giving the original mock-up a test drive. That makes him now about uh, 17 or early 18 years old. Uh, this mock-up is the first one that, uh, that we had used and uh, it was made out of wood and paper and was delivered to me so that I could uh, see it and get a feel for changes and so on that I wanted to do. Uh, and this is the mock-up that was on the original mock-up stand and had weights. Uh, that later has been changed to uh, motor springs. Now, for many of the concepts that uh, went into this clock, they were novel. And so we first had to build uh, a uh, mock-up in plastic to see whether it would work. Uh, this is a uh, model of the uh, dual remontoir, the Wagner remontoir, our dual uh, counter-rotating uh, escape wheels. And uh, then the uh, uh, pendulums here. So this is just a rough outline of the uh, going train. And our original design, as you can see from the uh, mock-up uh, that, that was shown a few slides back, was really a very complicated, but still a plated spacer design. Now, you can see each one of these plates, it weighs each weigh about 50 pounds. 
even fully skeletonized, it would be probably about 30 pounds a piece. And we saw very, very quickly that uh, this design would not be practical for the hundreds of times that it would have to be assembled and disassembled and all of the subframes and so forth that uh, would be inside the machine. In the end, the machine has about 8,000 parts. So we decided to change in uh, 2009 from the uh, plate and spacer design, which is you're seeing one of the last uh, 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 pictures here of it still between the plate and spacers. And we made up a new mock-up, uh, which he did over there. He never did send, send that one to me, but I approved it over, over the uh, internet. And we're using here now, uh, instead of a plate and spacer, we've got pillar designs. So we have separate pillars coming up, which really allows us to introduce a lot of modularity into the design, which is absolutely necessary for any kind of shipping and servicing. So you're seeing here uh, the, the original mock-up and what we have today. So all the way back in 2009, even though we did not have an overall arching set of drawings, and that's always been asked, you know, where, where are your design plans? Believe it or not, this was largely designed on the fly. And we just simply organically made it come to fruition through what we saw here. And then Buchanan was able to do it to here. Um, all I can say is it is a reflection of, the, of his absolute genius to be able to do that. Now, again, I'm showing you here the minimum set of dials for 71 complications. There are, of course, a few dials that are scattered within the machine that also show uh, uh, other items like a day and date and so forth for setting dials and et cetera. But these are the main dials that contain the, the most amount of complications. This one alone has 15 complications in it. So now we're gonna go through the complications. I'm not gonna go through each one because we just have a time issue here. Um, and it, you, you'll be able to see them in the, uh, in the horological journal. But you will be able to see on this slide what complications are represented by each of the areas that are shaded on this right-hand side here. So we're looking at uh, the 1,200-year perpetual calendar. This calendar is really like a small analog computer and it will give you uh, the correct day, <clears throat> including all of the leap years and the 100 and 400 year exceptions to the leap year rule in both forward and reverse. And it will remember what it's subtracted or added as it goes forward and backward. Uh, this calendar is used in connection with the demonstration function so that you will know where each and every planet and uh, complication and moon and so forth and planisphere could be for 1,200 years. Um, you're never going to crank it that much, but it is possible. Then you have your main uh, time dial here, which also has sidereal and equation of time. And uh, then you have your equation setting dial down here with your uh, um, kidney cam. Now over on this area here, which is covered by this, this little piece, this is the uh, sun and moon rise set. And this dial here has all of these complications. And we'll get into that a little bit closer as we go through uh, the presentation. E each one of these complications will be seen a little bit, uh, uh, a little bit more closely. Now down here, we have the uh, Tellurian over in the top here, as well as the strike control. Uh, this has, um, in addition to being able to strike like a normal clock, quarter striker with a bim bam, it also has grand and petite sonry to it, as well as of course, being able to keep it off, which is 
since it's in my living room will probably be the case most of the time as I don't want to hear it every 15 minutes. <laughs> then you have uh, here the crown, which is the Ori. Um, it is based on uh, Han's design, which again, we'll go into a little closer uh, as we go and has every uh, planet out to Saturn. And uh, unlike most Ori's, it also has a complement of uh, moons with Saturn mm -hmm. as well as Jupiter and also accounts for the elliptical uh, orbits of all those planets that have them. And uh, also has the correct tilt for uh, Jupiter, Saturn, as well as Mars. Then also on the bottom, on the left-hand side is the crank that you use to demonstrate it. It also has a two-speed transmission as well as a cutoff for the Ori itself because uh, uh, Saturn goes around once every 19 years. If you wanna see it actually move, you have to uh, disconnect it from the rest of the mechanism so that you can fly this one a little bit faster. Then on the right-hand side, we have a thermometer. Uh, what clock is complete without a thermometer? Uh, so I put that there basically because we had already done all of the functions that we wanted, yet we didn't have the symmetry that we needed between these two dials. So that's how the uh, thermometer really was born, was to keep the symmetry of the, uh, of the clock itself. Then down here, we have uh, the planisphere <laughs> and uh, also the uh, uh, four state of wind functions. Now, these four state of wind indicators were put in while it still was being driven by weights, which really doesn't make a lot of sense. I mean, if you want to know where you are, you just look at the weight. We just did it because we could. Uh, and in the end, when we went to the spring drive, turns out that these things now become very, very useful. Now here you're seeing the completed left and right hand uh, um, sectors of the clock. So you get a little bit uh, closer look. You get also a nice feel for the, uh, um, the enamel work that we did. In the beginning, we could have chosen between enamel or having uh, sterling dials engraved. And Buchanan's engraving, as you'll see as we go, is, is, is excellent. Uh, but there's something about uh, enamel dial work. Uh, I, I, I like to collect French uh, empire and pre-revolutionary clocks. And the enamel work is really makes those, uh, those uh, clocks stand out. So. I decided to go with enamel work for this. Now, starting off early in the construction, we start with the frame. And what I'm trying to show here is some of the detail work that Buchanan does. And like here, for example, this bead work in the, in the base, this is something that you'll never see unless you are really, really looking hard because it's all filled up with mechanism. But we do it because it's the right thing to do. Uh, it's something that will set this piece apart from anything else. There is nothing on this machine that is, hey, we'll do it a little less better or a little less finer finish because we think no one's going to see it. We don't assume that. We assume that every part will be able to be seen even though we know it won't. But we do it because, again, it's the right thing to do. Now, here is the enamel dial work that's being done by uh, uh, the folks out in China. They were brought to me through uh, Bob Crowder's ProClox uh, firm. And uh, as long as you give these folks uh, the artwork, they can copy it pretty much perfectly. And uh, they did a, a marvelous job. The other tribute to Buchanan is that he was able to produce the artwork in the first place. This is actually all of Buchanan's mother's work. She is the artist that actually does all of this little filigree design and so on, as well as all of these zodiacal figures that uh, we 
copied from uh, Jean Vier's uh, uh, masterpiece clock that he produced uh, back in 17, I believe, 89. Now here's a planisphere dial. Uh, this is the first dial that I had uh, the painters do because it's the most complicated. I wanted to test them to see could they give me a decent dial. Uh, and as you can see, they have reproduced all the calligraphy, the star field, hundreds and hundreds of dots to represent the stars, as well as uh, then the uh, zodiacal figures on this. They also gave me what I'd asked for, which is a little bit lighter blue in the center. And as you go out toward the perimeter, it gets darker, sort of like what you see on the horizon as the sun is going down. This gives you a picture uh, of the uh, uh, completed dial work in all of the bezels, which are uh, uh, plated in, in gold. Now we go to the uh, calendar function. And uh, to give you a 1200 year perpetuality, you have to do a number of cams, uh, 100 year cam, 400 year cam for, uh, for the uh, um, clock to remember the exceptions to the leap year rules. So what we did is we created a mock-up in a three to one uh, because the actual uh, uh, piece is a little bit bigger than a, a wristwatch. Uh, so we had to have something that was larger that we could test. So this is our test piece here. Now, if you go to my website, you'll see this uh, uh, illustration and it points out all the different functions. You have uh, several surprise pieces here that are, that are uh, allowing you to go from, from the, the various uh, months, lengths of months, as well as the exception for February. And then again, it gives you a, a whole listing of, of, of how the cams work and how they achieve what they try to do. Now in this slide, uh, we're seeing some pieces of this cam work. Uh, this is a great illustration of Buchanan's work and his philosophy. If you look at the crenulated edge here, this is what you see in the prior slide is the index wheel here, okay? Now the easiest way to make the index wheel is just to have a solid piece with, with the uh, various teeth on the edge. The second easier way is to do a cutout, you know, with spokes and still use this. Or you do something like this, which is of course the hardest and yet the most beautiful way to achieve that end. Um, again, you'll see the cam work is all beautifully uh, cut out. And here's your, your comparison to a wristwatch. So it's of course much fatter than a wristwatch because it has many layers, but it's not a whole lot bigger. And of course, all these dials have been French silvered. Any silver dial that you see in the mechanism, uh, we use a French silvering technique to give it a nice frosted look. And here is uh, the um, components of the perpetual calendar, which is, again, more like a small analog computer. It can compute, it can store information, and it can act upon it mathematically. So you've got your linkages that start from the simplest, which is the day, and, the, and here the linkages are shown with the various uh, readout components from the cam work to the readout wheel and uh, the logic cam work, which is down here. And then you go to the month, same with uh, all of the logic cam work and the, and the uh, readout here. And then finally the year linkages. And of course it gets more complicated as you go along because the year trip has to depend upon all the information that it receives from the day and the month. This is the completed uh, perpetual calendar, 580 parts and about eight months to design and build. Uh, the other thing about Buchanan is he is lightning fast. Uh, I don't know how many folks have tried to get parts made for them for 
their collection or whatnot. But uh, I think it sometimes takes eight months just to get a wheel cut if I want it done here in the U.S. Uh, so he is a remarkably fast worker. And this is a close-up of the dial itself. Uh, you'll see that the uh, year readout, the odometer, we use flats uh, instead of just a round cylinder. Uh, we think it gives you a better presentation. Uh, and then, of course, you have your French silver in here and all of the beautiful jewel work. We have about 700 to 800 jewels that are used in the clock with the balance of the uh, pivot work done in ceramic bearings. Now, this is just a quick overview of a typical construction. Uh, here we are doing the uh, bearings for the retrograde dial readouts for sidereal time. Here you have your three uh, um, roller bearings here. But of course we can't leave it like this. This is way too, too ugly and plain. So then Buchanan's mom comes up with several designs for me to choose from. And uh, the one that I pick is always the most difficult to execute, of course. And so then he puts a design on the, uh, on the uh, metal. And here is the, him cutting this out on the uh, fret saw. Uh, this fret saw cut every single flat piece from the frames to all of the wheels to all of the spokes. Uh, anything that's not turned in a lathe or on a mill is done through this one fret saw uh, through a pair of binoculars. Notice how he does everything in one pass. So the, the piece is, is cut out in one, in one pass. You could see the outside of this uh, and the inside through here. This shows you the delicacy of the part. This is what you see here. This is in the middle in comparison to his hand. Now all of the roller bearings are, are ready to go. And here we have our final uh, retrograde piece. There are two um, backings here for the minutes and the hours, which turn uh, counterclockwise in the uh, main dial work. And this is where it shows. Here's your main dial, mean, mean solar time. And then here is your equation of time. And then here are your two retrograde dials for the um, sidereal time. Now I know sidereal time is normally done in a 24 hour uh, format, but I wanted to be able to read it simultaneously from a regular dial. So you mentally have to correct uh, by adding or subtracting the 12 uh, uh, hours from this, but you can read it directly from this silver hand here and here, this silver dial that's located right here that points to the minutes. This one points to the sidereal hours. And then of course you have your regular time here. Now for your equation work, you need a kidney cam. Now, one of the whimsical things that we do is we say, look, if we've got a kidney cam that represents uh, the sun as it moves through the sky, why shouldn't we have sun rays? So we make sun rays for the uh, spokes. Now, this also shows one of about 14 pages of ledger work that he has to do to create this cam. So what you have to do is take the cam and then say, okay, we know where our dial pointer has to be at any given time throughout the year to get the correct equation of time. But that has to then be worked out backwards to create the surface of this cam. So you divide that cam uh, into 73 points for five days each, gives you 365 days. And then he has to do 16 separate iterations where he takes out the cam and recuts it until he finally gets it right. So he's got about almost 1,200 tests that have to be done in order to get the correct shape so that the dial is, uh, the hand is at the dial where it belongs. 
Here's the differential work for uh, this uh, kidney cam. Again, a photo I put in just because I thought it uh, shows off his work very, very nicely. Here is the uh, cam installed. You can see it just back here with the sun rays. And uh, we have a worm driving uh, this wheel here for driving the cam as well as the uh, calendar to set it. And down here, you can see one of the uh, uh, duration dials here from one through eight days. Now we're gonna move on to the time of sun and moonrise and set. Now, if anyone is familiar with the way that the orbit of the moon is around the earth, it is devilishly difficult to accurately represent on a two dimensional dial. Um, and the reason for that is that it really over the years, uh, it looks more like a torus than it does an actual simple planetary orbit. Now, the way that this is done and the way that it was done on uh, uh, the clock that we used as a guide, which is the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, astronomical clock in Strasbourg by Schrilgeb, uh, he uses uh, seven anomalies that are needed to correct for the difference in the uh, moon's orbit around the earth. Uh, we didn't go that far, uh, we, there just, just was, too much money and, and, and too much time to do. But we did account for the two greatest anomalies. This is called the great anomaly, as well as the projection. And between those two, as well as the uh, uh, equation of time, uh, you're able to really get it down to under uh, an error of about three to four minutes. Now, the other thing to remember is that we're doing this on, on a really small dial. We're doing this on a dial that's about four and a half inches. So to get better uh, accuracy on the readout of where the moon is vis-a-vis uh, -vis the uh, um, uh, sky really doesn't make any much of a difference. You really wouldn't know uh, looking at it. Now this gives you an idea of the uh, some of the math that uh, is involved and the drawings and so forth that go into making uh, something like this. Now here is an actual uh, uh, drawing from the Schrilliger clock in Strasbourg. And he's showing you the various anomalies and they're represented by cams. And each of these cams moves uh, a little bit uh, uh, differently in relation to each other. And the sum of all of those cams moving in relation to each other pulls this armature up and down. And that is then translated into the position of the moon. Now you're looking at uh, a, a, a design drawing as well as a uh, drawing that's needed for creation of all of the uh, wheels for the uh, module. There are about 50 wheels in this module. And this here is what's called a Jean Vier uh, infinite uh, variable differential. And it has a slant wheel. I don't know how many of you have actually seen uh, Jean Vier's work, uh, but it is a very, very beautiful uh, piece of horology and one of the more difficult ones to understand because the wheel looks like it can't possibly work. Now we have, and let me get a drink of water here. Okay, <clears throat> get my throat back. Now here you see the actual um, uh, wheel uh, slant wheel design in this. And what happens is as it moves, and I'm trying to see why I am not able to get this one to open, but it is not opening. Lock on it. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Here we go. So here's, uh, here you'll see as he's, he's putting it in fast forward, you'll start to see how this wheel 
begins to slide along the stirrup and he'll stop it for a moment and you'll see where the stirrup is in relationship or the uh, the uh, wheel is in relationship to the stirrup and it slides across that uh, opening this this little slide here you'll see this wheel actually does move back and forth along that uh, stirrup on the inside and that then varies the uh, rotation of that differential and then one differential is then fed into the other and then you have your output here so within this same mechanism we have uh, some shutter work and this is our shutter work for the sunrise and uh, moon set. And of course, for sunrise, let's have Mr. Sun peeking up over the horizon. And for the moon, we have obviously the stars in the night sky. As an indicator for our sun, we have a small Mr. Sun here who will later be given blue eyes with blue screws. And then we also have the moon uh, which is a Halifax type moon. So you can see the phases and it moves in this very, very thin one millet, one and a half millimeter thick ring of glass. And that glass is actually cut all the way here around the moon. So it's really a C shape. And he was able to cut that out with a water jet, very delicate work. Here's some of his uh, engraving, and you can see that in comparison to a fingernail. And here are the various pieces that go into this uh, uh, particular complication. And here you see the, uh, the complication itself for the uh, sunrise and moonrise and set. Here's your Halifax moon. Here are your shutters. Again, a one and a half millimeter uh, glass, blue glass with sterling silver stars stuck to them. And then uh, some various indicators here. Again, uh, uh, the, the um, Jean Vier slant wheels here along with their setting dials and then their names, the great anomaly here. This uh, also acts as a counterweight so that both of these are perfectly poised. And here you can see a video of it uh, from front to back. Again, here are your, your counterpoising uh, uh, names, your setting dials, Just a piece of artwork all on its own. Now here are your 17 uh, uh, complications. Um, slide nine showed what all the complications were. And again, you can read those in the, uh, in the uh, uh, journal. We used a script for everything that referred to the daytime and we use block lettering for everything that refers to the moon, the nighttime. So you can make everything easily seen. Here's Mr. Sun just peeking out over the horizon. And then here you can read the hours before and hours after for your moonrise and your moon and your uh, sunrise and sunset and uh, the actual sunrise and sunset. Uh, read off of this uh, uh, dial here. Now we move on to the Tellarian, um, and you can. I wanted, what I wanted to show here was how a lot of the drawing is just done the old-fashioned way, just done by hand with a compass, uh, not done on a uh, a CAD uh, CAD device. 
And uh, here you're seeing the uh, various layers with the uh, uh, ceramic bearings that are used. And again, all the hand math work that goes into this. Here are drawings of the uh, triple frame that consists of the uh, uh, rotating boom that is used for the uh, earth and moon system. Uh, all the red spots here are the jewels. And uh, this is just a schematic of, of everything that's inside. Now here again, we get to have a demonstration of Buchanan's beautiful uh, uh, cut it, cutting out for the framework. Everything is curvilinear. The only straight lines you're gonna see in this entire mechanism is in the base. Uh, outside of that, it's all curves. Here's your triple frame. And uh, if any of you are familiar with uh, uh, some of the uh, Ori's and Tellerians that have been made by Balbazar or Rango or even Jean Vier, uh, their work is nowhere near as visually beautiful uh, in the frame design. It's basically just a rectangular slab that's moving around, whereas we have a whole lot of beautiful uh, angles, uh, or not angles, uh, curves and uh, uh, flying ends here and here, just because we wanted it to be beautiful. Now here, um, I'm, I apologize for the noise, it was supposed to be muted. Uh, here is one of the few areas where we are using a CAD uh, because we are taking a piece of um, a mammoth ivory, we couldn't use actual ivory because that's illegal. And uh, we are cutting out the earth on this. And through using a CAD, uh, we're able to enhance the areas of the earth that have mountains because on, on a bowl that's only uh, two inches wide, you would, uh, you would not have, it would be a smooth surface if it were to scale. And then after that, uh, he is inscribing uh, the lines and the outlines, and then uh, stains it with uh, a dark T, uh, just like they do for scrimshaw design. And this is what I was trying to achieve, was something that would give a, a, a warmth and something that gave it a little antiquity. And uh, scrimshaw is uh, what I wanted it to look like. So here you have uh, the completed earth along with... Uh, um, we have a couple of items here that allow us to literally be able in conjunction with the perpetual calendar to show where on the earth you will get a, um, uh, an, a solar or a lunar eclipse, where and when, and for how long, which is a, a approximately eight hours, it will travel and where it will travel along the face of the earth. And that is used through interpolation of, uh, it, it's controlled by this. And there's an inner dial here that you interpolate from the uh, readings that you get from the eclipse window. And the eclipse window is down here. And here is your nodes because the uh, solar eclipse and, and lunar eclipses are controlled by the uh, angle of the uh, moon's orbit in relation to the ecliptic, as well as uh, where it's positioned uh, in the sun. So you're able to know exactly when this is going to begin and end through the use of these two smaller dials here. And then here we have also uh, the sidereal and synodic months. And those dials are all located underneath the earth. So there's quite a bit going on uh, just in this little uh, area here where the, where the earth is. And this shows a, uh, a, a video of it moving very quickly. You can see the, um, the uh, uh, sunrise and setting uh, uh, areas here, as well as the uh, um, moon rise and set. As, as evidenced by the rings. And then again, you can see how the synodic uh, and sidereal uh, dials move. 
we're using here, this was put in before we got our final uh, stone here, which is a, a rutilated citrine that we used for the sun. And then again, you've got your, uh, your dial work here all done in the French silvering. This is the actual dial. Uh, this light shows a little better. Uh, this is a little bit more of what the color will look like. And then here again is your, your earth. And we also uh, uh, added in uh, both uh, Venus and uh, Mercury uh, to this uh, and put in uh, um, Jade and uh, uh, I don't remember what this is, Jasper, I believe it is, but uh, that's shown a little later. The moon is made of course of moonstone. Here we go, these are the, uh, <clears throat> the stones that are used within the Tellurian and the Ori. Um, so you've got your, your Jasper, Serpentine, Turquoise, uh, the uh, earth, we uh, have the uh, continents outlined with gold leaf. And uh, Jupiter, we even tried to find a little bit of uh, lines like what you see there. We couldn't find a, a, a thing for the eye, for the storm that, that somehow we couldn't find in a natural stone. If we could, we would. And then all the moons are done uh, through uh, pearls. This is just the uh, uh, showing of, of how Buchanan is making the, uh, the uh, uh, continents on, on a globe of turquoise uh, with the gold leaf. And uh, then here are some more of the subsidiary dials. Uh, these dials here uh, show you the elliptical orbit of the, uh, of the planets, both in uh, uh, astronomical units and in millions of kilometers. And then another shot of the uh, bezel work, all the bezel work that was, uh, was plated. This is the Ori. It is the most complex module. Uh, it has 111 wheels and 739 parts. However, Buchanan tells me that the most punishing um, the most punishing uh, uh, complication that he made was that perpetual calendar. Uh, and that's because it's really unlike most any other horological artifact you're going to see. It's not mostly wheels. It's mostly levers and cams and leaf springs. And, and uh, just conceptualizing and carrying it out was a very difficult um, to do. This gives you another shot of the Ori, uh, along with some of the dial work here and the labeling uh, for it. Uh, all of these uh, uh, bezels here are knurled. And we like to add a little bit of color. That's what we did with our enamel dialing, as well as with the uh, uh, semi-precious stones that we, that we use throughout the project. Now here is a, a, an example of what, what we call Buchananization. And this is where, uh, again, if you look at a regular Ori, uh, like the one that was based on for Han, this arm here would have been a straight arm from here to the center because you're delivering power from the center hub outward if you've got moons that you need to drive around the planet. And that would just be a bunch of idler wheels going back and forth. Instead, because we're using a, a not only a curvilinear frame, but what Buchanan does is he stretches out the wheels and then counters that with other smaller wheels to achieve what otherwise would be a set of idler gears, but instead fills up a whole lot of space. So instead of just two bare arms here and here, you've got a whole lot of wheel work covering what's going on in the empty space. That is done throughout the project. And even though, you know, I, I, no one's gonna lie to you and tell you that it is a simple machine, it is a very complex machine, but the machine looks a lot more complicated and a lot more densely filled because we purposefully did that by varying the diameters of the wheels where we made them uh, uh, fill more of the space than what would otherwise be done if you were using a more compact uh, design. 
Now here you have a, a three quarter view from the top. Uh, I thought it was a pretty funny saying where I said, if a spaghetti factory made wheels, this is what it would look like. And I think, uh, I think he's right, <laughs> to be honest. Um, once again, uh, you know, you can see the wheels filling up the spaces and he does that all over. But uh, nonetheless, it still is uh, an impressive sight. And uh, another view from, here we go. This one is uh, showing you in fast motion, the wheels of the machine. Now we go into the striking uh, area. Uh, what I wanted to show on this slide is again, sort of the way things are done. Uh, first, you start off with a, uh, uh, a schematic that is just a, functional, a functionality schematic. What kind of parts do we need? What kind of snails, what kind of linkages do we need? Then he takes a photo of what's there. That's what's in the background. And then draws onto it and says, okay, if we wanna locate uh, a rack over here and over here, we're going to need uh, a lever about like this and it has to go around this and it has to go here. And then he does the same for uh, part of the repeat mechanism as well as uh, some of the uh, uh, detents and unlocking mechanisms for the racks. Now, I could have gone through several slides showing, you know, how the parts are stuck on and so forth, but for time brevity, uh, I just decided to go right to the finished product. Now here you're able to see some of the bird analogs that we're using. See how they're pecking? They're, this one's pecking and then this one's pecking alternately to raise the rack. And of course it has a beak and it has a comb, and it has a set of tails. Uh, this is part of the escapement, and it also is a bird with uh, the uh, jeweled beak and comb and has gold feathers that are out, out of view here. This is the uh, dial for the control uh, of, the, of the Grand and Pettit Sonnery. Uh, as well as silent and another view of the uh, duration dial below. Now here we go to the thermometer. It is the only freestanding item in the clock, which is not connected to anything else. Uh, you can see again, some of the very fine work, this little uh, fusey chain here for a watch that's used to uh, um, translate the uh, movement of the uh, bimetallic ring, which is this, to the uh, actual dial here. This is a uh, box that he sets up to uh, rate it and make sure that it is, uh, is accurate. And here's a view of the bimetallic strip. Very, very early on, as uh, it was discovered that you could put the two strips together to get movement for uh, a readout. The original way it was done was through all of these multiplicity of screws. Very, very shortly thereafter, uh, they were simply fused together. Um, we did it this way because we wanted to have the multiplicity of these beautifully blued screws. And by the way, Buchanan uh, made his own special oven, uh, which is accurate to within a half a degree. And that way, all of our parts, including hands, screws, everything that's blued comes out perfect to the exact same color. And even thin, long hands are very easily done in that furnace or oven, I might say. Here's a close up of the uh, thermometer. And you have here a reading of uh, degrees and Celsius, 
through this double hand here and having a uh, one uh, having Celsius uh, in blue and Fahrenheit in black. We now turn to the uh, world time and demonstration dial. Um, this one was a little tricky. We already had the dial made up for it way back in uh, about 2013. Uh, so we didn't, we weren't able to make the uh, world time dial big enough to actually have a city for every hour. You know, normally you would have 24 cities, 24 hours. Um, so we just decided to put a few of them in and, uh, and go with that. Uh, it's one of those compromises that has to be made once in a while. Uh, here again, you get to see the beautiful blue and contrasting red that is sprinkled throughout the background of, uh, of the brass uh, movement. Uh, one thing I did forget to add is that all of the wheels in the main trains, the bigger wheels, are all made of pink bronze, whereas all of the smaller wheel work, all the behind the dial wheel work is done in regular brass. So you'll also have that pretty contrast when you look at the machine. It's not as obvious when you see it in an overall uh, photo as you did at the very beginning of the presentation. And now the planisphere, um, you're seeing here, uh, again, another example of Buchanan's work. Very, very thin spokes, very, very thin rims. Um, if you have a twitch in your hand, you'd crush it. Uh, everywhere where it was technically possible, where engineering allowed us, <clears throat> we use these very, very thin wheels. They accomplish two things. One, they look beautiful. And the other is it cuts down on mass. So you cut down on, on uh, friction and the input power that you need throughout the uh, machine. And when you start multiplying wheels like this, where you have, in the, like, as we do here, about 550 wheels in this machine, um, friction is always the stalking horse. It's always the enemy at your back uh, be, because that is where uh, bad things happen when you start to get binding and, uh, and friction. Here's the mask. He beautifully uh, uh, milled all this out on his, uh, on, on his mill. Here's another sun, very similar or not similar exactly, like the one that was in the sunrise moonrise uh, set dial. Here you can see his eyes have been installed. And this is the actual wheel work for the planisphere. This wheel here, which is this one up here, is almost as large in diameter as the main wheels are for the barrels. Of course, the barrel wheels are much fatter and, and thicker. Uh, this is also unfortunately never going to be seen because it's hidden behind this and you'll never see it unless you remove it from the machine. Now on this dial, I have a uh, silver plaque that's been screwed down and it is in Latin. And as you can read below, it basically is translated as uh, uh, from the uh, poem by uh, Ovidius, uh, known mostly as Ovid from an epic work that he wrote in 8 AD called Metamorphosis. It actually covers about 14 books. And in the one section, it, there is the moment where uh, God separates man from the animals. And so what is written here is to God gave an upwards posture bidding him to behold the sky and gaze upon the stars. Uh, whereas animals generally look downward, man is to look at the face of God through the stars. And I thought that that was an appropriate uh, uh, inscription for the planisphere. Now, obviously, o uh, Ovidius uh, lived in Greece at 8 AD. He didn't know about primates, uh, but I think we can give him a pass on that. And finally, we uh, went from uh, very late in the project in October of 2019, uh, we decided to dispense with driving this with weights. And you would have had originally a weight set of uh, 
about uh, 100 and, or not 100, uh, 230 pounds are, are shown through this. And then we had to have a structural steel stand because we had such a terrific amount of weight. That added another about 150 pounds or so. So we had a, 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 about 350 pounds and we ran into an issue because we found that we were unable to get an eight day drop, eight days from a two foot drop because, because the weights were so big, we would have to cut down the duration to a, about six and a half days if we wanted to get the line of sight for this upper work here to be anywhere at a decent level for your eyes. It would be almost looking like it is here where you're looking from underneath the Ori ring. And that is pretty unacceptable. So we had a Rex uh, gave us, uh, Rex Swenson who follows this project uh, uh, gave us the idea of using motor springs. Um, I had never heard of motor springs and apparently uh, we, we never thought about them or we would have done this from the very beginning. So we took everything apart. These are the original barrels. Buchanan cut them up to look like this. So we have two spools here where we used to have two solid barrels together. And then inside of those spools goes these motor springs. And of course, now we have our duration, which really becomes useful because we have springs instead of weights. And this is the completed conversion. So you have a, a spool, a take up spool and a supply spool that reverses from front to back. So you cover both of these wheels with each pair of spools, same thing over here. And then this is now showing the backside with our beautifully blue rosettes on the back, as well as our blue uh, uh, click springs. We were very lucky that these springs fit inside. We really didn't, didn't have to move anything, didn't have to move any wheels, didn't have to do anything but just retrofit the barrels. Now here are a few interesting items just to look at. We have a, a Robain Remontoir that mediates the release of the Celestial Train. And I wanted a, uh, a, 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 a different kind of chain, something that had uh, little, little uh, uh, spurs in it like all the rest of the ivy shaped parts. So of course, if you have that, then you need to have an interesting looking uh, pulley also. And so that's what we use here. There are over uh, 385 parts just in the chain link here. And that was all stamped out on, uh, on a press. And this is the celestial train. It is the middle train. The clock consists basically of three main trains. You have your going train, of which part is in the celestial train because your escapement is here. The celestial train in the center, which is the most complex. And here's your Robain Remontoir. And then you have one that has both the quarter and hour strike combined into one train. And then here's a, uh, a quick rotation of of the center train. There's a uh, interesting uh, quick story of a, of a friend of mine who makes clocks in our chapter three, the Chicago chapter, the NAWCC and about halfway through the presentations that I were, was giving as this clock was being built, he finally told me that he could no longer look at it because it makes him depressed <laughs> because, because he simply couldn't bear to see what was being done. Here are a few other shots. This is your, uh, uh, your uh, time uh, strike quarter and hour strike train uh, here. 
And uh, this is your time train here, along with your dual Wagner uh, gravity driven remontoir. Here shows part uh, of the, the two trains without the center train. And here are all of the trains installed uh, without any of the uh, dial work on the front. So he's just kind of giving you a show off picture of all of the metal that's, uh, that's in the clock. And then this is another, just to show you the Buchananization, you know, how, we, how we're able to make the wheels look like they're just spilling away from the uh, main frame here. And here are again, your, your trees with your fruits on the end of the branches. And here again, your remontoir is spilling out, out, out of, the, uh, of the wheel work of the uh, 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 machine. These are the uh, pendulums. They were made uh, of uh, 348 parts, 12 anti-friction wheels. This whole area here that you see, this area that's outlined here, this is all one piece. Took two weeks each to uh, cut out. And there can be no mistakes or you gotta throw it away, but he rarely makes a mistake, I have to say. This is the uh, fret saw that I told you about earlier and everything's done through the binoculars. He actually cuts down on the amount of time it takes for finishing of the spokes and of all of these cutouts because he takes his uh, saw blades straight out of the package and then he sharpens them with a diamond. And then he retrofitted this fret saw to run slower than what they normally do. And even though the cutting is slower, it's more accurate and there's far less uh, finishing work that has to go on afterwards. So it's actually a more efficient way of doing it. Here are your escapements, again, for your uh, Harrison uh, uh, wheels, uh, your beaks, your combs, and your uh, gold and uh, silver feathering. And now you have a shot of the front, shot of the back. You saw a lot of that at the beginning. Uh, again, a three quarter elevation of the machine from each side. Um, what you see down here is uh, a flame mahogany uh, base that actually acts as a blind. What is behind this is a, a, two, and a half, two and a half inch thick piece of aluminum block that holds this frame. You see this frame is actually made in four pieces, one, two, three, and then four on the other side. Because of the weight of this machine, uh, if the table it's on or the surface it's on is not perfectly even, you could get racking to occur if there was any deformation of this base. And of course that racking would be magnified as you go up these uh, pillars and the machine would bind and you'd have a catastrophic failure. So this piece is hidden under this and uh, it keeps it always perfectly uh, level at all times. And then you have a side view. Um, anyone who's collected skeleton clocks knows that if you look at them from the side, they're rather boring with just uh, arbors and some wheels. And I think we've managed to avoid that here. And that is the end, gentlemen. Mark, that was absolutely fascinating. <laughs> the attention to detail, quite incredible. Well done. Um, I think at this point I'm going to be quiet and just um, and, and, and ask anybody who would like to ask a question to unmute themselves and in, in orderly fashion um, ask Mark the question. Sure. Nigel, Nigel Pratt. I'm unmuted now, am I? You are unmuted, Nigel. Mark, I see that uh, your name isn't on the clock. Buchanan's of Chelmsford's name is on the clock. <laughs> I, 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 I got the impression when I read the HJ article that you designed the clock. Okay. So why, 
Oh, go go ahead. I'll, I'll wait till you're finished. So, so why isn't your name on it? Well, my name is going to be on it. That's actually one of the final things that has not yet been done. Uh, the the name is going to actually appear on the back, and it's going to be right here, because that's really the only space that was left. It will be right down on the base. It'll have my name where it was, uh, uh, where it, it, its final destination is, which is in Chicago, and the year that it was made. Okay. Thank you, Nigel. Uh, Mark, is Keith Scobie yeah. over here? Um, you said the timekeeping wasn't brilliant with it, but I mean, what is the timekeeping qualities of the clock? Well, that's still being determined. Um, there are some glitches that uh, sometimes makes it go quite a far off. Uh, but we're, we're zeroing it down now to about a couple of minutes a week. That's brilliant. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Yeah. There's so many complications and so much friction in the system. That's yeah. remarkable. It is. Right, right. What well, well, we're having our issues. Uh, now, these springs here are, are um, uh, not, um, not uh, uh, it's... Uh, I'm trying to remember. It's it's a uh, it's a special material that does not change. With, invar. It's not invar. It's another one that they use in uh, balance springs in oh, watches. Right. Uh, that's what it is. Invar is is for pendulums. The other one is for uh, for springs. Right. And uh, when we originally fitted this out, it had uh, just regular steel springs. And wow. I mean, we were talking 15, 20 minutes variation a week mm -hmm. on it. Uh, so that helped it a lot. The problem we're having now is that once in a while, because as you mentioned, there's so many components, sometimes it just simply goes crazy. And you'll go from, oh, an average of maybe three minutes or so a week to suddenly it'll speed up or suddenly it'll slow down. And then after a while, it'll go back again to a fairly consistent rate. And clearly that's happening because somewhere in the machine, we're encountering some kind of shift in the parts, either in, in, in some kind of friction to make it run slower or some other part is, is moving in a way that's making it run faster. Uh, we're also discovering that uh, these compound pendulums is to no surprise are very, very sensitive to where you are moving the uh, adjustment weights. And there are some sliders here on these, uh, on, on these uh, here. There are some slider weights and you can also adjust the tensioning of the uh, um, balance springs, both on the top and the bottom. There are verniers to adjust for that. Um, originally I asked Buchanan about these, uh, ball weights are about five pounds a piece. And I said, look, when I reassemble this thing, are they marked? And he said, nope, there's no need to mark them. They're all made perfect. Uh -huh. And I thought, well, uh, you know, on, on these kinds of compound pendulums, they're not that perfect. And he found out much to his dismay after he put it back together, after polishing it, it was all screwed up. And so it took him several days of rearranging and so on. He says, you know, Mr. Frank, you're right. I'm going to have to mark these things. But surely, surely with so many slow moving complications, you're always going to have a timekeeping error. And I mean, that's, that, that's an acceptable when it, it's such a masterpiece, isn't it? Because it's, it's more than a clock. And I mean, it's, you know, um, it's I think a terminology you, use, you used once, which has stuck with me for a long time, is definite eye candy. Yes, it's a kinetic art. And, and kinetic, uh, yeah. timekeeping is really not the point. And if it never keeps time, I could frankly care less. Yeah. So long as it runs and entertains me and entertains anyone else who comes in the room, that is the point of the machine. And Buchanan has told me over the years 
as the machine has become more and more uh, built out, that the time between when somebody steps into the room and first lays eyes on that machine and the very first words that escape their lips gets longer and longer and longer. Mm. And that is what I've been trying to achieve. I want you to walk into the room and I want it to grab you by your throat and not let go. I think you've Everything achieved that. Secondary. You absolutely have, yeah. You've achieved that with tonight's talk. Yeah. <laughs> As well, yes, goodness me. No, it's an absolute magnet and visually, it's just in, in quite incredible. I mean, just to think of all of those complications working simultaneously and keeping to that, and I will call it a degree of accuracy, I just think it's frankly amazing. It is amazing. It's I, I would imagine that, that once it comes here and I put it back together, the timekeeping will probably be awful. <laughs> and and I'll, have to, I'll have to fiddle with it for a long time. But I'll be surprised if it ever really, truly keeps within two or three minutes on a consistent basis. <laughs> but it's going to be one of those clocks which is always going to have a place in history from now, Mark. I think so, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's forever going to be the Buchanan Frank clock, isn't it, in a hundred years' time, wherever it ends up. It is. That's right. Where Where is it going to end up is a, is a good question. Um, Not a question. I, I would like it to go to a public institution. Um, so far, I've not had a lot of interest. Uh, <laughs> But of course, it hasn't arrived yet in the U.S. Uh, once it does, I uh, will, uh, you know, make a film and and uh, and see. At some point in time, it will get donated to the proper institution. I think some television stations will be quite interested in doing a documentary on that for the wider public. Could be. I I, I would like to contact the local public television station and see if they would be interested. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think at this Hello. point, sorry. No, I was going to say at this point in time, the fact that it's in in Australia in a very small town uh, precludes, you know, the, the the people from the institutions having an interest in it. Right now, all they're seeing is a film. I don't know if they've even seen this particular film. Uh, I, I would love for it to go to the Adler Planetarium, which is in my hometown and is one of the better uh, planetariums in the country. And uh, I think it would be a great fit. So I will pitch it to them first. Yeah. It'd be, it'd be interesting. I mean, it's, I'm, I wonder what the ballpark figure would be if that came up for a, a national auction. <laughs> it would be millions, wouldn't it? I would well, I hope it's over a million. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <That's a possibility. laughs> <do that>. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Nigel, you had another question. Yeah, another question. Um, how how much documentation have you produced so that in two hundred years' time, when somebody's got a problem with it, they can <laughs> fix it? Well, we'll all be long gone. You'll all be long gone. Right. Um, look, there isn't a repair manual, but if you go through the website, which is hundreds, if not thousands of pages long yeah. uh, since 2003 and all the videos and all the photos of it being built and put together. Um, I think that you'd get a pretty good idea how it yeah. works. There's also a set of videos that Buchanan had made for me, which I didn't put all of them on the website of how he put some of this stuff together. So he, 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 he has it all in pieces and he says, okay, this is how you, or he has it together. He says, this is how you take it apart. And this is how you put it back together. So he's done that for several of the complications, not all of them, but several of them. Um, the, the key thing here as far as servicing is that number one, it, it, except for very, very few easily accessible areas, it is a dry runner. And oil is the primary reason why clocks fail. So we don't have that issue because ceramic bearings do not require oil. 
the uh, design that we used for these anti-friction wheels back here uh, for the pendulums also allow us to not have to use oil. Um, and of course, Harrison's escapement does not use oil. So there's, so what we've done is everything that is lightly loaded, every arbor that is lightly loaded uh, and turns less than once per hour runs in a dry jewel bearing. Every arbor that runs quicker than that and is lightly loaded, like these fly fans up here, these governors for the remontoir, they are oiled, but they're right outside here. They're very easy to, to get to. And then anything else that is more heavily loaded runs in these uh, ceramic bearings, no matter how fast or slow that they go. Brilliant. The other thing we did is make this modular. Um, all of this, everything with the exception of the main dial here, this mean, mean, mean solar dial, all of these come away. All of it. This, this, the Ori comes off all like a quick release bicycle wheel. So if something goes wrong with any one of those, you don't have to take the clock apart. You can work on just that one piece. And, and then if something does go wrong deep within the clock, which I hope I never live long enough to see, uh, you can remove these three main uh, pieces right down to the frame. Now, I'm not going to pretend it's easy because you've got all of the strike work that runs across uh, all three of these, as well as some other wheels behind the, uh, these uh, uh, pendulums, but it can be done. And Buchanan has shown on a film how that is done, removing all of the, uh, the uh, strike work and so forth. And then these three main uh, uh, frames do come away. Roger, a question. <clears throat> One thing I'm very, very, very intrigued about, I'm looking at your article in um, Horological Journal, for example, at the um, uh, Sunset Sunrise Cam Drive and Pages of the Moon, and you look at, um, you've stated a target of so many days per bed, that, uh, that, that sort of thing, and then what you've actually achieved. And for this particular one, the error is, uh, I haven't got my reading specs on, but so many seconds in, in a very large number of years, uh, being a tiny error. How have you actually arrived at the um, wheel train, gear and pinion set necessary in order to achieve that accuracy without having too many wheels? And I remember reading an HJ or model engineer, but I can't find the article again, in which there was a very clever PC program which set about that task. So how did you arrive at the gear ratios to um, mm -hmm. arrive at the various complications? Well, you're absolutely right. There is a very clever program. Uh, early on when we were begun this project, it was just simply sweat, but you can go onto the internet now. And again, on my website, I even have the URL and I show a, a screenshot of it. It's instead of a PC, you can go right into uh, uh, the internet and there are these uh, programs that will do exactly what you're saying. And they do it uh, and you can say, look, I'm trying to achieve this input versus this output with this number of wheels. So you can vary how many wheels are there. You can vary all kinds of, of, of parameters to arrive at the correct uh, result that you want using different <laughs> variations of input and output wheels. And that's on the internet, yeah. No, that's fine, thank you very much. Yep. Brilliant. Any further questions, or have you all been completely lulled into silence and in the awe of this machine that we've just seen? I have one more, if you don't mind. Keith, please do. Um, it's a cheeky one, really, Mark. Um, I noticed on your world time dial, you didn't put London, the home of Greenwich Mean yep. Time. 
I saw that too. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> are, you, are you having a go at the spritz by doing that? <laughs> I thought, I thought what, to be honest, I think what happened was there were several cities I wanted on there, but because of, this, of, of the space that's there, we wanted to have the cities fairly spaced out. Ah, uh, you could have put London in. And I think <laughs> London just didn't make the cut, you know. <laughs> I remember that when I make mine, I'll cut Chicago out. There you go. <laughs> you know, one thing I did notice on about this HJ article, you know, I've been getting HJ for many years, and uh, Buchanan had uh, put in something on his uh, double pendulum clock about six months ago. And there were several letters to the editor, you know, making some disputes or asking questions or whatever. And so when the article came out for this, I was just waiting to see us. And surely somebody's going to find a mistake. Somebody's going to find something, you know. And, you know, we're now two months past, not a word. So I wrote to Buchanan and I said, you know, there has been no comment on this. I said, either nobody cares or they just simply don't understand what they're looking at and they can't even begin to comment on it. So I thought that was pretty funny. It could also be that like, they're quite like your colleague that they were so in awe, they dare not ask a question and just gave up. <laughs> I think they gave up. You know, I think, I think that's what happened. They just looked at it and said, okay. <laughs> Give me a headache just looking at it. <laughs> that, that's just unbelievable. Mark, that was absolutely a fascinating <laughs> presentation. Incredibly, in, incredibly de 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 detailed, and I, I love I love some of your descriptions when you were looking at something um, which is incredibly complicated um, in terms of complication, and, and you're just simply saying that quite a bit of thought went into it. Come on, a bit more than quite a bit of thought went into it. This was just amazing, and also I was hugely impressed to see that you actually did proper handcrafted drawings. I'm a, being an absolute dinosaur in terms of my own work. Um, <laughs> Everything is drawn by hand, and I can only applaud you. Absolutely fantastic. And then we come to the quality of workmanship and the cooperation and, 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 and the way that you have worked with Buchanan. I mean, Buchanan's work is absolutely amazing. But he didn't achieve it on his own because, of course, clearly you were there steering him and, and the two of you worked together so well. Mark, absolutely fascinating. That, Thank you so a, much. That's a whole, that's a whole other story as to how the relationship was able to hold together through 15 <laughs> years and being as far away from each other as you can. Yeah. Uh, right. You know, can't lie to you. Can't say it was always a bowl of cherries. There were, there were bumps along the road, but the integrity that he has, he stuck with it. And I got to tell you, most, most people, I think they would have gotten about halfway through this and they would have just told me to pack it in. So he stuck with it. it. It there were bumps, but he stuck with it. Well, what a magnificent team! You did well. Thank you. I think, unless anybody else would like to um, have the final word, oh, my, Nigel. I have another, I have another question. Yes. <laughs> so, who holds the copyright for this movie? You or Buchanan? I do. The reason I ask is. If he's asked, and it won't be by me, by the way, if he's asked to make another one, is he allowed to? No. He's not. I hold, the copy, I hold the copyright to the design, the machine, as well as all the photography. Wonderful. Okay. Yeah. Right. I'll run tomorrow. Bob, would you like to just have a few words in, in final conclusion? Bob Whitehurst. Yes, of course. Thank you. Mark, this has been a wonderful presentation. It only gives me one problem, and that is I'm responsible for organising the programme for our club and branch. I can't top this. <laughs> it's been so good. You've given me an enormous problem. <laughs> Not that I would want to top it at all. Thank you very much indeed. I, I've loved every moment of it. Uh, my jaw's on the ground, but I, I'll slowly pick it up. And... I don't think I'll get so much sleep tonight because I'm, I don't think any of us are because we'll be dreamy of this thing. Um, so once again, 
Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. You can imagine what my dreams have been like over the past. <laughs> yeah, years. absolutely. Well, you certainly achieved it, and it is a dream machine. Let's hope it gets here in one piece. <laughs> absolutely, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Just, That's all I'm thinking about now. <laughs> <laughs> I should keep an eye on the weather for when you permit it to fly. <laughs> My goodness. Right. right. Mark, thank you all. Thank you so much again. And, and thank you all for joining us and, um, you know, and, and for the, the individual bits of contribution. But, uh, and thank you. And, and, Ke and Keith, thank you very much for, for joining us this evening. It was a pleasure to have you, have you on. And um, uh, <laughs> I know you're inspired just the, to the same degree that we all are, which in itself is um, quite, a few, quite a bold statement, I think. I think, it's, I think it's an absolute masterpiece. I think it is. It is. Yeah. Thank you. So There's not many people who can say they've had their dream built to their specifications without compromise. And I'm very blessed and a lucky man to have been able to meet a man with the talent of Buchanan who could actually build something out of my fevered imagination and at a time when I could afford it. Brilliant. I'm just, just the luckiest guy on the planet, <laughs> can I say? <laughs> <laughs> so mark thank you again you're welcome absolutely brilliant brilliant, oh, brilliant. thank you okay thank you, thank you mark. good night to you all and thank you so thank much. You so much and thank you mark. yeah thank you're you. Well done. Thank, you. Brilliant. thank you thank you bye -bye. amazing thank you